to do something that is going to be both difficult and perhaps in a short time even illegal. I want to talk about the growing influence of Islam in the body politic and the way in which it appears to be gaining power and traction uh, at the expense of freedom of speech and above all of, of Christian belief and ethos. One of the things I do in Ashenden Scripted is to is to take some of the articles I've written in the public space and reform them for this particular uh, platform. And I wrote one recently that was much ignored <laughs> in its written form, and I think partly it's because uh, in order to satisfy the editors, I wasn't being too provocative, it has to be wrapped up in a sort of reasonable presentation. Um, I'm trying to avoid the reasonable presentation and sound the alarm bells uh, in on YouTube. But of course, there's always the risk that YouTube might close you down in the same way that there's a risk that editors may feel this is too hot to handle. But let me explain how I come to the position that I hold in terms of the growing influence of Islam in our society. I used to work in a university and I, I did two things. I was a, a senior academic lecturing in the psychology of religion and I also ran an interfaith chaplaincy. And as part of that chaplaincy, I had Jewish and Muslim colleagues as well as a range of, of uh, ecumenical Christian ones. There was an occasion one night when I had organised a, a fairly high-powered religious symposium and the last speaker was going to be my, my Islamic colleague, an academic of some international distinction. But it was very hard getting off campus. And so one of the, just slightly before quarter to five, he leant over to me and said, Gavin, I, I think I won't give my paper. I, I'd rather just go home because that way I can get off campus before the traffic jam starts. And I said, but everyone's looking forward to hearing from you and you've got an important contribution to make. Well, he said, the thing is, I've been here for 30 years now. And uh, I came here with this explicit intention of being a missionary for Islam and playing my part in helping bring about the Islamic Republic of Great Britain. And you see, the thing is, I've succeeded. It's now quite clear from the demographics that Great Britain will be an Islamic society, an Islamic Republic, in the middle of the next century, during my grandchildren's lives. Actually, it's happening so fast it might even happen during the lives of my children. So I've accomplished all I need to, and I've been doing these gigs mainly uh, in order to curry hospitality and favours, but I don't need to do them anymore. I can go home. And he left. After the conference was over, I rushed away and I checked some of the figures he'd given me, the demographic influence of Islam in this country, in terms of birth rates, immigration, cities where the Islamic community were going to be in the majority, the numbers of mayors they aspired to a point. And to my enormous surprise, he hadn't exaggerated at all. And since then, I've been watching the growth of Islam within our country do exactly as he projected. The difficulty is that we're just at the point now where, with a new definition of Islamophobia having been adopted by one in seven councils and all but one of the political parties, and with a general election due this year, we may be faced with a new blasphemy law being passed into criminal law, which means we won't be able to criticise Islam or even be perceived to criticise Islam. Islam. This isn't the moment when I want to deal with that particular definition of Islam. We might do that in a later broadcast. But what I want to do is to take something that the government has recently done, which for me rang all the alarm bells. It was a very simple thing. And I think it's one of the reasons why the piece I wrote about it hasn't had much traction. It was to do with an Islamic monument, with the government being offering a million pounds to build a monument to Muslims who died in the First World War. At first sight, this sounds very dull and boring. And I think, again, that was part of the reason I had trouble getting the piece I wanted uh, read as much as I hoped it would do. But it seems to me that actually it was the canary in the gold mine, in the coal mine, sorry, and that it represented really quite a serious change in the way in which a new Islamic narrative was being prepared for our country. And so I tried to explain that in the piece 
And that's the piece which follows. So thank you for listening. I hope this context explains why this isn't Islamophobia, this isn't bigotry, uh, this isn't paranoia. It's a defence of the freedom of space that we enjoy in a context where Islam has found itself with a much more powerful leverage than we expected within both the civil service, within government, within the media, with what are going to be enormously serious consequences. So thank you for listening. Timing is everything. The Chancellor of the Exchequer has just announced a few days ago before this recording was made that the government is going to be funding a Muslim memorial to those Islamic soldiers who fought on the British side during the First World War. And we've been reminded that other religions have got similar memorials. And that, that is true. But I thought there was more to this than meets the eye, and I want to try and explain why. If we look at the other memorials first, well, we must recognise that they do indeed exist, though almost no one knows about them or pays any attention to them. I remember to my great surprise when I lived in Brighton to discover a memorial to the Sikh soldiers who as part of the British Empire fought in the First World War and died. The memorial is situated just a few miles north of Patcham, a suburb of Brighton, on the northeast corner, on the South Downs. I was invited to a service in the memory of those who had died there, and I wondered just how it was that this Sikh memorial place came to be there. And the answer turned out to be quite simple and pragmatic. Wounded soldiers were put on the train and brought back from France to be cared for in England, and a number of Indian Sikh soldiers were amongst those brought to the hospital in Brighton. Some recovered, and others died. And immediately after the First World War, it was decided as a mark of respect to build a memorial to those Sikh soldiers who died from their wounds. It's true that very few people know about the soldiers that were brought from a distant part of what, at the time, was the British Empire to fight the United Kingdom's European enemy. But, although multiculturalists will suggest that the provision of Islamic memorial is just an expression of the cultural diversity that existed, even in 1914, the truth may be a little bit more complex and multi-layered. Islam is not just an alternative religion to Buddhism or Christianity. For example, there are no concerns about or definitions of Buddhistophobia, Hinduphobia, or even Christophobia, which might temper discussion amongst people who weren't fans of any of these religions and wanted to criticise them. There is no blasphemy law for Buddhism, Hinduism, or Christianity. But there is an important growing movement to both widen the definition of Islamophobia and impose in either codes of political practice or even the criminal law prohibitions of criticising Islam, which has become a present reality. How might we understand this new concern by the establishment to build into our civic history the presence of Islam as an element in the understanding of the First World War? What's really going on behind this move? Perhaps the first thing we need to do is to think a little bit more about the impact of the First World War on the subsequent developments over the following century in Europe. Europe has been in serious trouble in the last 50, 60, 70 years after the end of the Second World War. I was brought up to understand the origins of the First World War were deeply complex. I wrote history essays on it. Indeed they are. In all, it involved something like 70 countries. It produced a death toll of 17 million men. It brought about the collapse of four different empires, German, Austro-Hungarian, Ottoman and Russian. And depending on which school or fashion of history you follow, there are a variety of ways of interpreting the grand narrative of what this war represented. represented it. <clears throat> Obviously a boiling point of expansive colonial nationalist ambitions between the major European powers. And one of the populist taunts of Christianity is that the way that the Christian clergy on both the German and the British sides blessed the weapons of mutual Christian slaughter was an abomination. 
a mockery of what they stood for. But perhaps equally as bad was the attempt that the most people don't know about to theologically justify the aggression. At the beginning of the First World War, a group of theologians and intellectuals in Germany published something called the Manifesto of the 93. It sought to justify the actions of the German government and particularly the brutal invasion and rape of Belgium. So, tit for tat, at the British government's request, the Archbishop of Canterbury at the time, Randall Davidson, took the lead in collaborating with a large number of other religious leaders to write a rebuttal of the German contentions. Both German and British theologians claimed their side had the just war theory's justification. Inevitably, this has always raised the question of the tragedy of national nationalistic interest dominating Christian moral vision. The British, the British and German cousins were able to contemplate slaughtering each other. But should European Christians have been able to contemplate doing that? And that in turn raises the tragedy and the question of the Reformation. There was no collective identity amongst Protestants, but there would have been if Europe had reigned Catholic. Of course, there were national wars between Catholic nations in Europe before the Reformation, but all of them represented a failure of the Catholic imagination, a failure of Catholic identity and piety. However, the very concept of the just war theory implied a degree of moral and religious accountability amongst Catholics in Europe. And it wasn't even unusual to invite either moderation or validation from the papacy treating the Pope as a kind of moral empire for the wars that were being fought. His support was essential to undermine the moral claims of conflicts that went on. But partly because of the Reformation and the new dominant Protestant constituency in England and Germany, the Pope was no longer recognised as a moral arbiter in Europe. There wasn't one. But does the failure of Christians to resist mutually slaughtering each other have any implications for the long-term struggle between expansive Islamic ambitions and Christian self-understanding and culture which has resisted Islam? An overview of the failures of Christendom over the centuries suggests that at moments of catastrophic failure of relations between Christians, one of the consequences was to create a vacuum that Islam, always pressing its expansionist ambitions, filled. One of the most striking and distressing examples of this moral failure was the Fourth Crusade, in which Western crusaders sacked Constantinople, Constantinople under the pressure of Venetian merchants. This chasm, this breach, this tragic fissure that this created in Christendom led to the sacking of Constantinople after its isolation from the West by Islam. It wasn't immediate, but it followed and was a consequence. It also very nearly led to the defeat of the whole of Western Christendom, both at the gates of Vienna and at the absolutely essential battle of Lepanto. And the moral is this, when Christendom turns on itself, Islam pushes at the weakened gates of Christian society in order to enter and to dominate. The First World War represents a repeat of this catastrophic collapse of Christian vision and mutuality that we saw in the Fourth Crusade. It becomes, as a, tip, as a type, a neo-Fourth Crusade. It has become increasingly compelling amongst historians to see the Second World War as a completion of the first, just one conflict with a break of 21 years, a kind of pause before the conflict was resumed and completed. Historians will note that whatever the complexities that led to mass migration of the second half of the 20th century, which mainly comprises of Muslims moving into Europe, it followed on the collapse of Christian self-understanding and mutuality in Europe. Now, whether mass immigration happened and was encouraged because it was seen as a solution to falling birth rates or to the pension crisis or to a darker death wish in Christian culture, nonetheless, it can only happen because of a profound ignorance of what Islam believes, how Islam acts, 
and what its ambitions are, which you can find in the Quran and the Hadith and in history. One of our problems is we're not allowed to talk about Islam. We have instead to talk in euphemisms all the time. We are already muzzled and silenced. And a wholly, wholly unnecessary and improper distinction has been made between Islam and Islamism, as if Islamism describes an aberrant political extremist variant amongst Muslims. It doesn't. It expresses a perfectly proper Quranic ambition. Whereas, in fact, Islam is actually a well-balanced hybrid of religion and politics. And this rather confuses the West, because every time we want to treat it on religious terms, it can change its position and speak to us and act politically. And every time we want to deal with it politically, it can change its terms and speak and act as a religion. This completely bewilders Western critics who can't understand it, since they model Islam on a rather poor understanding of Christianity, as if it was a kind of Arabic variant, or indeed a third Abrahamic cousin, which it isn't, for several reasons. First of all, because the Abraham we find in the Quran, although he shares the name of the Abraham in the Bible, is not the same figure. And secondly, because the Allah, the God, in the Quran is an entirely different God from Yahweh and the, God, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The idea of Islam as an Abrahamic cousin is a dangerous deception and fiction and simply isn't true. It's a form of revisionist theology. We might explore the demographic acceleration of Isl the Islamic presence in our country People put an Islamic majority somewhere between 250 and beyond. But all we do then, I've discovered, is we end up arguing about variables and when the exact moment of uh, Islamic majority comes, rather than taking notice of the fact that it is inevitable that it will come. I think one of the most useful wake-up calls was provided by Michel Hulebeck, H-O-U-E-L-L-E-B-E-C-Q, -E -E in his extraordinary novel, Submission, which astonishingly was published on the day of the Charlie Hebdo assassinations in Paris. In this novel, he explores both the desire of Islam to change the French of the face of French society and dominate it, and the political means it set about to achieve doing it. We have to ask the question, is there a desire to Islamify our society in which the numbers of Muslims and their political cultural influence grows? You're not allowed to say so, and it's presumed there isn't, but is there one? We could quote Muslim voices themselves, just as I have done at the beginning of this piece, but we run the risk of being told that these voices are not sufficiently representative and we're scaremongering. But the present tensions in our democracy do indeed reflect the going, growing leverage of Islamic influence and look at what effect they have. This is not hearsay. This is not choosing one voice or another. This is just a description of what has happened to us politically in the very recent past. This brings me back to Islamophobia. Let me describe what's happened and what is happening over briefly. In 2018, the all-party parliamentary group, APPG, on British Muslims offered a definition of Islamophobia, which, as I quote, is something that is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. I hope alarm bells are going off seriously in your head. You will know that you can't use racism as an accusation of being anxious about Islam. Why? Because Islam is comprised of very many different races. It has nothing to do with race. It is cross-racial. And then, but calling it racism, of course, means that all our anxieties about being racist are evoked. And racism itself is a kind of thought crime that is type of thought crime that is immensely problematic, but we will deal with that on another occasion. For the moment, let's just notice the trick 
that's being preyed on us in associating criticism of Islam with racism. It then goes on to say it targets expressions of Muslimness. What on earth is Muslimness? And much, much worse, perceived Muslimness. In other words, if I, as a Muslim, consider myself a victim of your criticism, which is anti-Muslim or in folks anti-Muslimness, you are guilty of Islamophobia. And if one of the consequences of being Islamophobic is to be thrown out of an organisation or a workplace, or as we suspect later on this year, to become criminal, then we have a new blasphemy law. You'll be pleased to know that the Conservative government didn't accept this definition, but plenty of others did. It's been adopted by one in every seven local councils and by every single political party except the present government for the moment. And it stands every chance of being given legislative identity by the next government and being passed into the criminal law, making Muslim Islamophobia a criminal offence. Meanwhile, MPs are resigning because of threats made against them, not by extremists, as the press calls them, but by Muslim activists. And the procedures of the House of Commons have been frustrated and sabotaged, not by extremists, but by the influence of Islamists or Muslims. We've noticed that on the street, patterns of policing have been dominated by a pre preference on behalf of Muslim activists, the genocidal demonstrators who chant from the river to the sea. Other protesters have been treated in completely different ways. They've been treated harshly by the letter of the law. Critics have identified this new definition of Islamophobia as creating a new de facto blasphemy law which protects only Islam. Which is why at the beginning of this piece I said you cannot see this in terms of multicultural equivalence. There is no phobic definition for any other religion. It has been brought in by Muslims in order to stop us discussing our reservations about Muhammad, about what's taught in the Quran, what's taught in the Hadith, and the way our reservations about the way in which Islamic culture is growing in influence and power. In the context of the growing influence of the Islamic community in Parliament, in the civil service, in councils, in the political process of this country, amongst the police, what might the funding of a Muslim monument for the First World War actually represent? Is it just an attempt in cultural parity, the less, latest example of multiculturalism? Timing is indeed everything. There might well have been a case for a monument to Muslims from the many different countries that lent their support to the British Empire between 1914 and 19, 1918, but there wasn't. So why is it being considered a priority now? And here's the rub. There is a growing suspicion that this is not primarily about honouring the memory of people who died over a hundred years ago, but rather by recreating a new history of England that gives Islam greater prominence, greater traction. The stimulus for this is not so much an accurate representation of nostalgia for a multicultured, multicultural empire as the need to Islamify British history. Why does this matter? Well, it might matter if the collapse of Christian belief and commitment in our society had created a vacuum that was filled by anti-Christian values, which it has. It might matter if those values involved a visceral hatred of the Jews, an exponential growth of anti-Semitism, particularly as it's expressed and called, as it calls for a new genocide of the Jews in Israel. It might matter if it produced a culture where freedom of speech was impaired 
and threatened, or an atmosphere where our democratic representatives, MPs, resigned because they feared for their lives because Muslims had assassinated them. It might matter where women's rights are freshly contested. It might matter if only one religion is given protection of new blasphemy laws and its Islam by the use of a definition of Islamophobia, which cannot be justified, sustained, or even, frankly, understood. There is no such thing as a free lunch. It may be also there's no such thing as a value-free Islamic monument. When will our country wake up to what it is about to lose? The fact that we can't talk about these things in public without being censored or accused of Islamophobia makes this very difficult. The fact that what I'm saying and writing now may very well by the end of this year become criminal makes it almost impossible. We don't know what we can do except to raise the matter and to communicate our concern, but perhaps above all to say to those who run our political processes, this is not acceptable. We are not willing to give up free speech, free thought, freedom of association, the freedom to criticise and assess and have a new blasphemy law imposed upon us. <laughs>